I think we go backwards then also with humanitarian aid by keep on expanding the space we're doing it and the geopolitics encourages it. I'm Raj Kumar and you're in the DevX Book Club. Maybe you're a global development nerd like me. Maybe you work at the UN or at an NGO, or maybe you're just excited to hear from some of the world's leading authors on the most important issues of the day. Either way, you're in the right place. Grab a snack, get a comfortable seat, And don't worry if you haven't read the book, you're very much welcome. Get ready for our discussion. This week's book club author is Stefan Durkan. Stefan teaches economic policy and directs the Center for the Study of African Economies at the University of Oxford. The DevX community likely knows Stefan from his time as chief economist at DFID, the UK's International Development Department, now known as FCDO. And he was also a policy advisor to successive foreign secretaries at the UK's foreign ministry. In his most recent book, Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose, Stefan argues that the politics in countries that are developing is as important as the economics. It's great to talk to you, Stefan. I think um, you know DevX well. I've read your name in our pages many times. I, I think you've spoken to Will Worley in the past, and I've certainly followed your, your work. It's great to get a chance to be together. Well, it's very nice to talk to you, and um, nice to talk to DevX. How is life outside of government treating you? I've spent six months traveling just now. So I've been to 13 different countries, 11 in Africa, two in Asia, and uh, spending everywhere at least a couple of weeks, usually a bit more. And, uh, you know, look, that's better than government. <laughs> that's definitely more interesting at this stage. Well, and you get to say whatever you whatever you think and feel, right? Yes. And well, it's, it's that. Look, to, to be really honest, I, the, given the roles I played, and they always knew I was part-time and academic as well, I always had a conflict of interest or kind of a, a rule that I could say anything I wanted. So... It's also maybe an issue is that they still take me as seriously as when I was in government. Maybe that's not that seriously. Well, it's one reason reporters, including those at DevX, love talking to you is because you're outspoken. You say what you think, and that's very refreshing and not always the case in the the development community. No, and it's, yes, but but it's always had to do a bit with my circumstances. I don't have to be too concerned about my pension, so to speak. It's not, I don't, I'm not a career civil servant, so so that helps. But I think transparency is really important. And that's the only way we get ahead is to to shine a light on what's, what's working, but also what's not. Maybe this is a good jumping off point to get it a little bit into the discussion, uh, because I'm curious to know about you a bit more. You know, you come through in the book to some degree, but... I'm picturing you in some of the little vignettes that you provide as a young scholar, researcher in Africa. That's where you spent a lot of your formative time. What was that like? Why did you, you know, what even drove you to begin with to, to wanting to be an economist and to spend time in low-income countries in Africa? Well, you know, I, and, and I don't know, maybe we need a psychologist to put me on the sofa to ask, uh, why it was, but I, even as a teenager, I was quite convinced I was going to work on something to do with these countries. And I was going to work on Africa, and I was quite clear. And, you know, once you get somehow interested in something, you inform yourself a bit more. So, you know, you go to university, you choose a topic that you want to work on it. And, you know, then the development part was always the one that just sounded more useful. You know, you you, you grow up in a in a well-off country, you know, there's, you feel little urge and little inclination to try to make rich people a bit richer. And, uh, and it felt more interesting to try to understand and hopefully contribute a little bit to make poor people a bit richer. How old were you when you went first to Africa? Where did you go? I was already, um, my, my, it was actually my first time on a plane I must have been about 21, and uh, the plane went to Ouagadougou, to Burkina Faso. Um, And so we ended up visiting a friend of a friend who was working in university there in Ouagadougou, and uh, we backpacked. So this was Burkina Faso in uh, 1988, I think. That had just been the time that someone called Thomas Sankara had just been murdered, who was this kind of charismatic leader. So you got also immediately in the middle of this kind of 
political story of Africa as well that always then kept on fascinating me as well. And when you think of those early visits to places like Burkina and the impression you had then of why people are poor, what you saw when you saw poverty and, and the challenges in places like Burkina Faso, and you think about how you consider it now and what you put into this book, Gambling on Development, what, what, what are some of the differences? What, what has been the evolution of your thinking? You know, I, I became an economist and then you get totally obsessed by trying to say, you know, economics matters and the way the economy works and understanding how, how it works for people or doesn't work for people matters a lot. So I think these early days, I was trying very hard to show that the technical side of economics mattered a great deal. I'm a microeconomist in training. Even at the time in Burkina, we were looking at how poor farmers were saving and using community level savings uh, of, of grain, trying to beat the seasonality. So trying to sell uh, in the right times and not too late and so on. So where you think, you know, these things really matter. And they are a little bit away from just the politics. You know, I remember often arguing with people and saying, when people say it's all just politics. And I said, no, no, what you do and technically what they do in the politics matters as well. I think what I've learned, um, and maybe I've gone a bit full circle, is that we can't understand the economics, not in terms of the economics understanding itself, but more what is happening in terms of the economic actions and the actions and behaviors of the key players in society to thinking about politics, not party politics, not the manifestos or the political color of a president or a prime minister, but actually somehow the way politics and economics interacts in, in countries. So I think, I'm not sure what how I would read my, uh, my book as a 20 year old now, and I probably would say, but surely technical economics matters here. And I, um, but hopefully there's enough bits and pieces there to, to give my 20 year old self enough confidence that, that the technical knowledge is important. But if you want to have change, you must understand the broader processes in society as well. Yeah, you get a sense reading the book of some skepticism that you have of the idea that economists can look at data and kind of come up with a prescription for a country, come up with a, a plan, and that you've, you've really come at this from a very different perspective, and maybe we can get a little bit into the thesis of the book. You talk a lot about the tango. Maybe tell people, what is this tango, um, and, and where does it fit when you think about countries coming out of poverty and getting onto a development path? The idea of the tango, it's very much about how the outsider can link to what happening within a country and the leadership there and the, what I call the elite, the key players in power and influence, you know, not necessarily the president's prime minister, but a broader class of people. Now, if you come as an outsider through aid or through advice, you just have to recognize that no progress will be made on anything unless the, the people that hold the local power and influence want to dance with you. And they actually want to do this together. You know, think of it if if I, as a technical economist, want to keep on telling you, you know, this is the 10 prescriptions you need to do, and maybe I'll get the support of the IMF to make these the conditions. If locally within the own political economy, they don't want to dance that game, the outcome is going to be quite chaos. You know, if I'm going to dance the tango while the other one is dancing the foxtrot, it will look very ugly. And it will definitely not be something that you could say, look, this is this is some form of progress here. This will be more chaotic. And I, I think that's that's where I kind of uh, very much in the book want to emphasize, you know, the outsider must be cognizant and totally willing to understand what the, the interests are that can be the vested interests or the objectives are of the other players that you deal with, because otherwise we're not going to make progress. And so this pure technical thing I can draw up the plan and here it is and my job ends and then it will be implemented. It's not like that. You know, the, the, what, what the plan will look like, what a dance will look like in practice will, ma it will matter a great deal what the other dancer wants to do with it. It's amazing how in the development community, even people who know these issues so well, we can often suffer from abstraction. You know, we can see this country far away and think, 
well, we can think of it as an abstraction and we can imagine the the different buttons we can push and and by pressing those buttons in the right order, we can somehow change things. And it, what comes through a lot in your book is, it seems to me, this evolution of your own thinking over time that, you know, actually it's a much more complex dance. And you, you come back time and again to the role of the elites. And I wonder if that's a more recent part of your thinking or whether you, you knew that even as a 20-something economist, but you really come back over and over again to the idea that there are these people called elites and they exist in every society and they have an outsized role. Maybe we can just talk a bit about, about that view. So, so it's important to, to, to try to define what I mean by the elite. And in fact, you know, there's a lot of political science talking about elites and then they have endless academic debates on who should be part of that elite or not. I want to just be clear what I don't mean that is some kind of, say, for example, a historical elite that is some aristocrats or whatever. That's not what we're talking about. It's not about the upper classes in that sense. What I simply want to use is more as a functional term, elite players, that those people who have power and influence within a society. Now, an important thing is not just the ones in power, but also the ones influ influential, and I'll explain in a moment. It's also not just about the politicians, in many societies, it will be the military, it will be, of course, business uh, community as well. It will be often be intellectuals as well, because they make the stories, the narratives. It can be trade unions, it can be uh, civil society actors, because all of them somehow hold some power or influence about the direction in which a country can go. And so I talk a lot in the book about the basic thing in any society is somehow understanding what is the nature of the deal between all of these. And this is why it's not just that the president wants to achieve something, but it's also that all the people who oppose the president, what's the common ground with the president? You know, what is the one that they, what will they disrupt or not disrupt? Now, why do I talk about the elite and not just about the people in general? Is that the one thing I definitely learned, and I must say, I definitely learned that partly from working in the policy space, but also from working in London in a government, is that actually, you know, um, some people are more equal than others to, uh, to get the Animal Farm quote from George Orwell into it, is that there are players that they not necessarily can direct where a country is going, but they have status quo power. They can actually block progress in a certain direction. And so it's these players that I want to typify, and these are so crucial for development. So my thesis in the book is then, these elites and the kind of implicit consensus or indeed lack of consensus they may have, it determines very much where a country is going. And if within that consensus, development is a strong enough part of it, that's a, that's a necessary condition to see progress in development. So even if you have a beautiful technical Ministry of Finance that may well say, look, we're going to do all these beautiful plans, if all these other forces there are just fundamentally saying, look, we're going to do all we can not to make it happen, it won't happen. So I'm imagining these elites, you know, let's say a business leader, um, someone from a wealthy family, and they're seeing challenges in their community, development challenges. Maybe the road uh, is full of potholes. And in a more, in a society where there's more of a development bargain, I guess those elites might partner together, they might go meet with the government, they might bring in church leaders, they might say, hey, we have to fix this road. And, it, and they're saying that in part because of self-interest. It helps them to have this road fixed. But in other places, maybe those elites instead get into their private car, go to the airport and fly to London and visit their, their apartment there or something. I mean, is that sort of the, the imagery, the, the way that we should think about this, like that somehow there are elites who are more connected to, you know, their self-interest is more connected to the development of their own country and there are others yes. who are more disconnected? And I think that last set of sentences sums it up quite nicely. And let me give a couple of examples so where, where it feels um, more on a macro level connected or not connected. And I think it's really interesting to look at, uh, actually look at China um, for a moment where, you know, the elite is, in a sense, quite stable since, since the Communist Party took over. And the elite is, is, in the end, determined by the way the Communist Party is operating. But what's really interesting, I think, is that 
um, up to well into the 1970s under Mao, ideology was far more important than anything else. So as a result, all economic policy and development policies were more inspired by ideology than by anything else. And so, of course, then you had the Cultural Revolution where that role of ideology was so extreme. Um, but then in the 1970s, the death of Mao, the battles with the Gang of Four, actually there's a real struggle going on in that elite, the Communist Party, of what that direction should be. And if you think of what the, the battle was between the reformers of Deng Xiaoping and then the Gang of Four in the 1970s, it's very much about, shall we keep on having ideology as the center of everything we do, or shall we bring in enough pragmatism? And the pragmatism was what the reformers wanted. They, they basically says, look, let's not have all the policies determined by ideology, but it doesn't matter whether the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. Let's actually have pragmatism and the striving for food security and growth make it part of it. Now, to come on that last point you made, why they do it, in that case, it's almost for survival of the Communist Party. This is not about suddenly an enlightenment that they suddenly want to serve the people. You could argue, you know, what's the role of a Communist Party, of a Marxist Party, if, if they don't try to build paradise on Earth? So there is maybe an element of the material well-being definitely fits into the ideology as well. But it was very much about having sufficient legitimacy with the population that actually it wouldn't, all, it wouldn't collapse. And it wasn't about politics, as we learned in Tiananmen Square. It was about the economy. And, um, and that was the key part of it. You can go to other places in Nigeria, I'm afraid, they do exactly what you said, they get on the plane and be in London. The elite doesn't really care that much what's really happening in their own structures, whether it's public good provision or even growth in the economy, because they can afford to get on the plane and, uh, and be in London and, uh, and ignore the plight, despite what they may say verbally. <laughs> The world is facing an unprecedented global food crisis. Here at DevEx, we're following the state of food insecurity around the world and the solutions that are needed to overcome it. I'm Teresa Welsh, senior reporter, and I'm also the author of DevEx Dish, a free weekly newsletter bringing you a comprehensive look at everything that matters in the world of food. Each Wednesday, DevX Dish will be your guide through the interlocking policy, infrastructure, climate, agriculture, nutrition, and human rights issues remaking the way food is grown and distributed. Visit devx.com slash newsletters to subscribe and get your weekly update on the race for a sustainable global food system. Now you talk about in the book your time as a chief economist at DFID, now FCDO, when you think about that agency and, and its perspective on development, does it connect to your view about the importance of helping these development bargains among elites to come about? Or is it more instrumental, more about a project or a program, um, a negotiation with a government? Do, do you think that have you succeeded maybe in getting this view into the way that that DFID FCDO and the way they actually operate and spend their aid dollars? Their I aid have pounds? to uh, give a secret away here is that all the case studies started live as uh, back to the office reports to DFID. So in fact, the book is about 70% essentially the things that I was writing and trying to develop, trying to encourage people to think about uh, probably two things, you know, be aware of the political economy and the political tensions within a place and not just be enamored by a finance minister who says the right words or someone who gives the right speech. And then secondly, to to have this kind of in your actions to to be aware that the big gain in the end is not just getting the project money well spent, but actually using it as a way of shifting the incentives in that society, that it becomes, you know, sustainable. And the sustainability, in my view, depends entirely on being able to shift elite bargains enough towards an importance of growth and development in these countries. Have I succeeded? I don't quite know. Of course, I'm realistic enough, having worked in that whole system, is that it is still UK taxpayers' money, and the pressures there to be more tokenistic, to have the Union Jack on the, on the package. All these things are go against what I think would be the really best practice to try to work with these places, 
but maybe you can't sustain it unless you do some of these things as well. So the obsession with uh, reportable short-term results and so on, I had to be sensible and accept that's part of the bargain in the UK of trying to sustain it. It seems as though the concept of an elite bargain applies as well to rich countries, to donor countries. And that bargain in a place like the UK, if you think about who's influential, certainly, you know, conservative media is influential. And they have essentially suggested very clearly for several years now, you know, we don't agree with this with this idea of foreign aid. And and they've undermined, you know, the, that that bargain that existed for a while. And, you know, when Prime Minister Cameron put forward point seven and and there was this sense of euphoria in the development community in the United Kingdom that, hey, this is we've reached a, a point now where we can we can achieve high levels of foreign assistance and we can do this well. And if it is a is a world class uh, technical agency, you know, we had this this moment. And then it sort of slipped away because that elite bargain broke down. And I guess maybe you could argue there's similar elite bargains in all the donor countries. And they perhaps have a bigger influence on how those development agencies, you know, whether it's USAID or DENITA or JICA, on how they operate than maybe the actual political economy on the ground in the in the countries they're meant to work. And I totally agree. And in fact, I think... I would push it a bit further, and I think I'm actually very worried for the near future here, is that you know what we should recognize is that this period that I try to cover in my book, say between 90, 1990 and 2018 and 90, was probably definitely the last 20 years of that period, probably the best in development that you had. And that's partly... Uh, you know, it was quite a good in terms of the economic cycle, so the resources could be increased, partly because of the political cycles that actually, you know, it may not have been end of history, as Francis Fukuyama said, but it was a temporary end to history in the sense that geopolitics was not the dominant force, including in the in the eighth environment. And even though maybe in, maybe most of the period I was there in, 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 in the UK in working the system with the with the right uh, or the Conservative Party, at least, struggling hard more and more to deliver it on simple self-interest grounds. If you now look at whatever political constellation you will have in any country, in donor country, this is a different age. And now it's geopolitics is central to what donors will be doing. And I'm actually, you know, and I keep on also telling my friends in, in other agencies as well, you know, that storm will come, you know, it will hit you. And the 1980s and early 90s were dreadful for development. Uh, we were, we loved imposing things on other places. We loved to uh, be very superior, but also, you know, it was the Cold War as well. And we're getting a bit in that kind of, it's a different form of it. But how often I've now heard officials saying uh, from foreign ministries, and I'm not talking just about the UK, but other countries as well, is that what uh, they now become mainly interested in is how they vote in the Security Council. Now, that's a very poor starting point to actually deliver developmental change in a, in a country. But that's now life. And so, you know, politics and geopolitics uh, becomes now even more important in development. And... I think we'll probably have to rethink then people like me have to rethink, you know, how do you want to engage with it and how can we keep this at least something sensible and let's not dissent in how bad it was in the 1980s. Right. It seems like a real risk. Um, I've written a little bit about this myself, that this growing conflict with China and obviously the, the clash with Russia, it's starting to color, you know, a large part of how development aid gets talked about. And you end up in these very transactional relationships with countries. And certainly China has already been there. Um, you talk a bit about this in the book as well. And, and of course, with more humanitarian crises and with the climate shifting, you could see development aid agencies like FCDO and USAID and others becoming very focused on humanitarian aid. And, and that becoming a big part of their budget and the, the long-term development that you talk about in your book, where you praise, for example, a worldview of, say, a Warren Buffett, and you say, let's bring that to our sector. 
uh, kind of an, a value investing idea, a long-term portfolio, you know, that view may get crowded out in a moment when you're doing immediate transactional diplomacy with countries to get them to vote against China or Russia, or you're trying to respond to emergencies. It seems like there's perhaps a perilous time that we're no, about I, to face. I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, the, um, with the climate crisis, the expansion of humanitarian aid is, is by no means the best possible response we could have. And what I mean is that, of course, we need to protect lives and the whole thing. But, you know, we've learned over time already so much that building up social protection systems that are owned by governments and so on are so much more effective for these kinds of crises. You know, you shouldn't have humanitarian agencies there. But it's this obsession with control. Humanitarian aid has an element is that you can keep much more control. You bring your own troops almost, uh, staff on the ground to, to deliver it. You use channels that you can control better via the UN and so on. So I think we go backwards then also with humanitarian aid by keep on expanding the space we're doing it and the geopolitics encourages it. A lot of people focus on the finance side on climate. Actually, the thing that I'm most worried about them on climate is actually the implementation of climate finance, the quality of spending on the ground. It's tricky. It's really hard. It's, we haven't quite done it. And we're going to target countries because, say, of, of nature, environment things and, and protection and whatever these things. We don't know very well how to do that. You know, but we can finance is the easy part. Doing that in an environment where it's all becoming transactional, you know, it's really going to be very tricky. And I fear that the risks combining, you know, where the only instrument almost that seems available, or the only two instruments is humanitarian and climate finance, each of them with real issues of delivery and uh, suboptimality of it. Not a good time ahead, I fear, for development unless we begin to rebuild how we actually engage around these, these uh, kind of pots of, of uh, money and learn the lessons, you know. This rhymes quite a bit with what you talk about in the book vis-a-vis -vis China and their approach. And you, you describe how many African leaders have told you that they think, they assumed that the Chinese loans that were provided would never have to be paid back. And they assumed that in part by the way that the Chinese didn't really have a lot of conditions on them and didn't really probe too much about the productivity of those loans. You know, would they generate new economic growth that could lead the governments to be able to pay them back or not? They seem to be very focused simply on providing the money and having some kind of a collateral. You mentioned in the case of Kenya that the the railway loans were, were provided with the collateral of the Mombasa port, which would go over to Chinese hands if the loans weren't repaid. Can you talk a little bit about how you see China's strategy? And do you think, is it failing at this point? Or will they be forced to shift it? Or what, what is the dynamic vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese strategy and, the, and what you see from you know, FCDO and, and kind of the Western donors, their strategy? Let me tell you a little anecdote is that probably in must be 2013, 2014, you know, I spent a summer in, in, in China, uh, moved my office there in Beijing and spent a whole summer talking to officials about Africa, so trying to understand what they knew. And so the first thing I would say, they didn't know that much, you know, that in-depth knowledge was very limited. And one of the things they went to came to differ because we were quite interested. Can we start? We saw this, 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 these banks going out. So could we build up a relationship and seeing whether, you know, and there's still a, a positive relationship with China at the time, and saying could we help them to make sure that the way they bring out getting out the, with the capital that it actually is reasonably well handled. And so the China Development Bank asked our help whether we couldn't do capacity building in what they called political risk analysis. But it was, diff was basically their quote worth saying, how are these countries government governed? How do we think about it? Because simply whether there is a single leader and a party in power or there's a democracy doesn't tell us enough about what they will do with the money. And so they kept on talking as it didn't materialize in the end. But that means already 10 years ago, the China Development Bank was already worried in their own portfolio that actually they were had no idea of how to deal with these countries. So they in themselves moved and quickly building up local offices because they needed people on the ground to, to judge this better. But of course, they had so much liquidity 
and that the only thing they could think of is essentially doing it like really old-fashioned collateralized loans. So interestingly, I think, now, of course, because their, their public image has been tarnished so much, including in Africa, because it's indeed the case, finance ministers and others kept on telling me, you know, if you don't give the low, the grants to us, you know, we go to China and China will never ask us to repay it. And I kept on telling you, I don't think that's how they will do business with you. And of course, that's how we see that, they, that they're not doing business with them. They also know that it gives them a very bad publicity. I, I definitely don't subscribe to the view that they did debt diplomacy, that on purpose they did it in that particular way. China is far less centralized in their in their international engagement via economic matters. These banks were all operating on their own and, and not very clear what the, what the guidance was. But we saw, of course, lending decline dramatically, and they clearly have to rethink how they're going to do it. So hopefully they'll re-emerge, because I don't think, me personally, it's a bad idea that China is there providing uh, finance for projects in some of these countries. It's just about how they do it. I ask you about that in part because you talk about China quite a bit in the book, but also because of your position as a, a leading development economist who has a lot of influence in this space. And in fact, that's one of the most fascinating parts of the book. You tell this vignette of uh, having to brief a new uh, minister, a state uh, a minister of, of uh, DFID. And I think I know who you're talking about in the book as well, having met her. And you had to you had to say, listen, I need to give you kind of an overall briefing on, on the state of ideas in, in global development. And you ended up putting together a presentation that gave a kind of a review of, of a really celebrity economist. And I, ha I happen to have seen that presentation um, when I was writing my own book and ended up talking about it and, and, of course, citing you, but talking about your analysis and adding my own little analysis to it as well in my book. And it is a fascinating idea. You know, we're talking a lot about elites. There are elite economists. And, and it seems as though their view on, on storytelling, on narrative, on how to describe the world we're in and, and why people are poor, why countries are poor, that those narratives have enormous power in determining how agencies like DFID or FCDO end up spending billions of pounds. I wonder if you could just take us through a little bit this interesting phenomenon of the of the celebrity development economist and and how you think it fits in. I think Jeff Sachs is probably the one that started with it, and I think others worked because followed because they're probably always surprised how how many people were buying his book uh, because it's an interesting thing. First of all, as an economist, the profession has had evolved to be totally against books. You know, in other social science disciplines, books are very important. In economics, it's something that, you know, your heads of department will look down upon if you try to do a book. And, um, and so it, it means the only niche there was was a little bit of an element of, of pop economics. You know, maybe I should go back, you know, Paul Krugman had done it very effectively before and probably a few others as well. But in development, I would say, you know, there was the kind of, Jeff Sachs, uh, the kind of view of the world. And, you know, definitely his view became incredibly powerful. I, I must say that even for myself writing the book, it's been a surprise to me how important it is, actually, even within the profession or whether it's practitioners in development or even economists that want to work on development, that you have an overall view of how the world works. You know, that you have a mental model about how the world works. And the problem is often for researchers is that they're very good at answering a very small question very well. That's, that's the nature of research. But there is a really important role in society that you try to actually help people to think through, you know, the, a simplified version of the causalities in the world. It's powerful because in politics, Politics is all about storytelling. Politics is all about narratives, simple causal models that you're trying to reach out to the people in your group or maybe the electorate to actually say, think like me. This is, this is how I'll explain the world for you and this is how I will change the world because this is my view of how it works and that needs to be changed. And so, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of power there. 
by doing it, yes. And if that story to the public is, well, countries are poor because they simply need a small amount of additional resources that will get them above a basic level of poverty, as Jeff Sachs says, get them on the first rung of the ladder, then the policy that comes from that story is more aid. Um, if instead you talk about David Cameron being enamored by the book Why Nations Fail, you know, if it's more about some problem in their governance, and uh, then it leads to other kinds of policies and other kinds of approaches, right? And so you really break that down in the book, you know, in, in quite an exciting way. And it, it does make you think about this fascinating situation we find ourselves in in the development community that, um, you know, they're not all white men, but largely these celebrity economists are, and, and they, they play this outsized role whether we pay a lot of attention to them or not, in shaping this kind of meta-narrative that affects the way pretty much all of our institutions ultimately work. Absolutely. And, and you know, you, you have some, you know, like Joe Stiglitz, putting it much more into the way the international f- system functions, while you get others, probably me, in saying, look, let's start first thinking about how it works in, in, your, own, in, in, in your own society, in your own developing country society. Let's make sure we understand that. You know, you get very different things and prescriptions of of how how uh, you you want to get involved, and of course you get also the other ones. You know, the Belize, the least, who then basically say you are the problem. I my view of the world is a bit like it's quite a mess. It's quite muddled. <laughs> uh, it's helpful to have models to think about it and and ways of thinking about it. But um, you know, just keep on learning from practice and from from pragmatism. And to see that you don't, you know, don't marry into the ideology of these ideas, but actually see whether you can make a bit of progress and then, uh, but then learn. But you do need to have, as these people offer, a big picture view of the world, um, because implicitly you'll have one. And so I want it to be, want people to have it more explicitly so it's clear and transparent. I think to be transparent, my implicit view is quite aligned with what you talk about in the book, in part because my earliest influence in this area was my uncle, who was a political scientist, not an economist, studying development in India and and elsewhere in Asia. And so I grew up thinking about many of these issues through that political science lens, and then I worked in politics myself. And so when you talk in your book about this idea of essentially a bargain, of figuring out the political economy I find it very appealing because often where I see the development community failing is in what I said at the outset about an abstraction of easily abstracting out. And we even get to the point as development professionals, and I hear development leaders all the time saying, talking about Africa, you know, we're talking about uh, low income and middle income countries. And, you know, as soon as you get, you, you, open the the lens and you take this very wide angle view of the world these countries become simple abstractions and you can you can just imagine yourself adjusting a little thing here and a little knob there and and you, and you somehow create development and and what I love about your book is how you really make it clear that look this is messy and these countries as soon as you actually pay attention to the DRC or to Malawi or South Sudan these are messy circumstances and it is not going to be easy to simply go in there and spend a bit more climate finance or development finance. And you need to think about why they are the way they are and what is that bargain. And I think that's a, it's a really powerful way of thinking that I think the development community could use a bit more of. Thank you for these, these comments. And it's, it's a framework to think about the place. It's not the beginning and end of it. It doesn't include everything. You know, it's for example, the framework I have, you know, I don't talk enough, for example, about which if I were to rewrite a book and I would definitely have a chapter is the geopolitical influence, you know, the, the dependency almost of some of the bargains of what's happening internationally. And of course, these are lenses. But but I think the power, the power of having a, a relatively simple framework and that question that you said, you know, why is it that some countries do quite sensible things? <laughs> why is it? That some other countries clearly are doing unreasonable and dare I say sometimes stupid things in their economic and development policy making. And it's not because they are stupid. It never is. It's never about lack of basic knowledge. I think it's 
digging a bit deeper in to understand, so why do they do it? And trying to understand why is it that you get these things? And it's a simple framework, but it's a helpful one that stops our over-optimism that we, if we, our, our deep belief in homeopathy in development, a little bit of small quantity of aid has these incredible transformational effects, which is clearly uh, not how the world works. So Stefan, we got a question from one of our readers named Neil Gandhi. And Neil says, reading your book was greatly refreshing. I've never heard or seen an economist speak so passionately about the role of politics and elite bargains in development. How can we encourage other economists to also engage with politics and elite bargains thinking? Well, that's a great question. So, so maybe the first step would be they could read my book. But the second thing is actually, and it's something I'm trying to think more and more about, is to, um, you know, when, when we do our economic, economic analysis, you know, economists love the first best, you know, the kind of perfect solution to a problem uh, you know, that, that would be consistent with all the distortions lifted and whatever. So it's a bit like when you look at a list of IMF conditions, they're typically like first best. You know, in an ideal world, that's what the technocratic economists would tell you. Or the World Bank would say, this is the best practice. And so I think one thing that I've been telling now a lot of my students and, and other, anyone who wants to hear it is to, you know, just learn to be very careful with your advice. Because... There are political constraints in any country. There's political economy challenges that make certain things possible, other things not possible, that will cause certain groups to capture whatever you propose and others not. So why don't we, in any analysis, whether it's a health program or an education program or an advice of what intervention works, immediately start thinking about when we, before we give the advice, please do this, you know, how would this work through a particular society that I know of, that, that, that I study? Why would those player, players, players that could stop it try to do it something differently? Why couldn't it be implemented and them doing it? So it's actually not about necessarily we change to do our analysis different, but we learn when we have to give advice and we are trying to suggest the policy implications are to really already start thinking through these things and don't leave it to others. And that's that I'm passionate about. Because if you leave it to others, then it's maybe just about the politics. No, no, no. It's the economists that think through what is the way you, it can work through needs to make that part of the thing they do. Maybe working with political scientists or people that do network analysis or whatever it is in the countries, but build it in. So, so I think it's a matter of building the politics much more into the way we do our research and analysis. And I will think we'll will become better at providing advice as well that makes more sense for the societies we work in. It takes us away from those simple silver bullet technical solutions and makes things maybe more challenging, but perhaps more yes. likely to it's actually It's the kind succeed. of thing, it makes the research a bit more messy and less clear cut at times and a little bit more, uh, well, definitely fewer um, magic beans or silver bullets. But, you know, that's one of the things that I definitely learned working in the policy environment our politicians always ask for the silver bullets and the magic beans. And, you know, we as people that are more knowledgeable, we should never have the pretense that we have it because there are no silver bullets or magic beans to solve these problems. The world is a bit more messy than that. Stefan Durkan is the author of Gambling on Development, Why Some Countries Win and Others Lose. You can follow him on Twitter at Gambling on Dev. Thank you all for joining. If you like the podcast, please share with your friends and give us five stars. And we really do want to hear from you. Please leave your thoughts in the comments or send me a message on Twitter at Raj underscore DevX. To learn what we're reading next, make suggestions for future guests or submit questions for authors, be sure to sign up for our DevX book club mailing list, which you can find in the description of the show wherever you're listening to this. If you care about global development issues and you want the latest news, don't forget to subscribe to the DevX Newswire at the link in the comments, where you'll get the day's top global development breaking news, analysis, and opinion, as well as the date of the next book club. Until then, do good out there, and thanks for joining.